with us. So please welcome Mr. Clay Jenkins. Thank you. <clears throat> that way, you dis can we get to the point where we dispense with all that? Well, no, because there's new people out here. So well, they, I'm and, sure they and we tape this ah, every right. time, and so we have to do okay. this. So you know, we just try to keep on focus. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to begin with, though, you've got another symposium coming up. I talked about the May thing, but you've got an April thing. You yeah, you'll see there are a bunch of handouts that you um, should get if you don't already have them. There's one with a, a book list on it, a further reading, both books by Richard Francis Burton and books about Richard Francis Burton. And on the back of that, um, I just mentioned three things. There is a symposium April 23rd, 24th, and 25th here in Bismarck about Prince Maximilian and, and Karl Bodmer. We did one in the fall here on campus. This one will be at the Radisson Hotel, and uh, it's going to be extraordinary. We're going to do a field trip at the end up to Fort Union. And then in the Eric Severide Symposium that I think we talked a little bit about the last time you and I were here that we're doing in conjunction with the North Dakota Humanities Council, uh, the dates are a little fluid at the moment, but it'll probably be first thing in 2010, early January or, or February 2010, and then Dickinson State's fourth Theodore Roosevelt Symposium on Family is this October 15th through 17th. So there are three public humanities symposiums coming, and just one change. The last time we did this, we did them, you had to register for this whole package. Now we're doing them in a very different way, and all of the humanities programs will be free and open to um, all, all people, and only a certain number of things will be premium things for dinners and field trips and so on. So the most important one for the moment is this spring. It's uh, on Shakespeare's birthday, um, 23rd, 24th, 25th of April. That's the Maximilian and Baudmer Symposium here in Bismarck. Okay. And where here in Bismarck? Radisson Hotel. Radisson Hotel. Yeah. Uh, I know the one that we uh, helped host uh, this fall was extraordinary. Um, we had it over in the National Energy Center, Energy Center of Excellence, a very good turnout. And I was amazed at the uh, folks that show up for these from all over the United States. Um, being able to do something like that uh, is just remarkable to draw those sorts of folks, I should say, from all over the United States to come to listen to some real history about North Dakota. Uh, is yeah, because you know Lewis and Clark came through, and we'll be talking a little bit about Lewis and Clark tonight, because Richard Francis Burton sort of lends himself into a, a contrast at times with Meriwether Lewis. But you know Maximilian and Baudmer came through in 1832, 33, and 34. They're really the next generation. And they were traveling in many respects using what we would call the software of Lewis and Clark. They actually had Lewis and Clark's maps. They had met Clark. Uh, they had read the journals of Lewis and Clark. They knew all the names that Lewis and Clark had given to land features. And so this is really the next wave of European exploration after the Lewis and Clark, um, the bicentennial of which we just celebrated. So we were so excited by the fall symposium that we decided to do another one. And yeah. it's going to be really, we're going to do a couple of things that we didn't do in the fall. One will be an art historical appreciation of Carl Bodmer and George Catlin. That's something that we didn't have time for in the fall. And we're also going to do a language panel about, you know, Maximilian was an Enlightenment traveler and he took down vocabularies of all of the Indian tribes that he met. And particularly, he got a vocabulary of the Mandan language. He also did Hidatsa and a little bit of Arikara. Well, today, as you, as you know, Larry, the Mandan language is just hanging on by a thread. Uh, and it, it, it's probably going to disappear. There are, there are fewer than a dozen people who can speak the language. And Hidatz is doing somewhat better, Arikara is doing somewhat better, but we're having a panel about Maximilian's role in taking down these languages, and then we're going to talk about whether it's even possible that there could be a sort of Manhattan-style project to help recover these languages, or whether when you get down to that few speakers, it's just too late. So it's a very interesting subject. And Maximilian is critically important because he did all this in 1832, 3, and 4. In 1837, the smallpox cataclysm came to the Earth Lodge villages, and the Mandan were reduced from about 1,200 individuals to about 140, and the culture really just 
collapsed. And so his taking down of this vocabulary and his ethnographic work amongst the Mandan and Hidatsa is now a critical archive of what that culture was before this epidemic. So this, that'll be a really interesting thing, I think, for this symposium. Okay, great. All right. For the topic tonight, though. I thought you wanted to talk about Mexico. Uh, should we talk about Mexico? Uh, you're the focus man. No, no, no. I don't. I, uh, well, what we were talking about up here is, is uh, what really is becoming a crisis down in Mexico, and I was just asking Clay what he thought about uh, if the, um, if the uh, government of Mexico collapsed, what, what a catastrophe that would be for the United States. I know so, nothing, so I'm going to pitch yeah. it right back to you. Isn't this nice? Yeah. Um, but I don't know. What do you, you think? You don't know? I, I mean, know. I'm sure it's not good. Yeah. You know, uh, we will get to our topic tonight, but uh, just as a, an aside at, at this moment, I was working with the, very closely with the Canadian uh, military uh, when I think it was probably 93 or 94. I might even be wrong about that. And some people here, there's got to be some Canadians out here. Um, and Quebec had the referendum the last time they did that. Um, but at any rate, it, was, it failed like 50.1 uh, to 49.9. Um, the separatist. Very close, the separatist movement. Right. And it was happening about the same time that Bosnia was going on and all that. Yugoslavia had collapsed. And, and so folks were talking about how terrible that was over there. And, and so we in the military were talking about sort of the American view of hell at that time would be the collapse of the Mexican government along with separatism up in Canada. And all of a sudden, we would have war refugees, possibly. I don't know if that would happen in Canada, although the First Nations in Quebec had said that they would not tolerate separation and that they would, by force, remain in Canada. And the Indians of the Canada Indi would stay right. in Canada even if Quebec <clears throat> left. Right, and that they would do that by force if they had to. And so we were envisioning this American version of hell is that uh, that goes on in Canada and then the government of Mexico collapses. And when we think about a few hundred illegals coming across the border in, uh, in the South now, just day to day, imagine that being millions of folks leaving war-ravaged Mexico, for example. I don't know that that's going to happen, but um, uh, so at any rate, so that's been on my mind for a long time about what we would do if something like that happened. And then uh, here two nights ago, I think, I was watching, um, and across the bottom of the screen, it said Department of Justice uh, says that government of Mexico may collapse. So there's people seriously thinking about this now. And uh, we all are familiar with the drug wars that are going on down there right on the border. And, and I just think that uh, we um, sort of take for granted the security that we have here in the United States in many, many ways. And when we saw Yugoslavia collapse, and we thought, well, that would never, you know, we would never be affected by something like that here in the United States. And I think we could be. And I think that we're in great danger now with uh, Canada is a different issue, but we're certainly in grave danger right now of something happening in Mexico, uh, collapse of the Mexican government, and, and uh, I just think it would be a catastrophe for the United States. And um, you probably don't want me to go on much further. They came here to hear about... Uh, so now we're going to bail them out too? Is that your plan? Is that my plan? Yeah, how do you say <laughs> what's, your, what's your solution to this crisis? Oh, I don't know what the solution to the crisis. I think it is a, a terrible crisis that's building on our border. I, I think that you know, all of us that, that, that think that we've got a terrible uh, illegal problem, whatever that means, with Mexico, with thousands and, of folks coming across the border illegally, that would pale in comparison to what would happen with the collapse of the Mexican government. I mean, so what you're worried about is some sort of a massive refugee movement north yeah. after an economic or governmental collapse. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it would be a catastrophe. And then, you know, we're already embroiled in Afghanistan. We're embroiled in Iraq. Uh, we must always have our antenna up for what's going on relative to China, particularly if there, you know, there was some boat incident recently. and. And these things escalate, and you know, mainland China is going to take back Taiwan someday, regardless of whether we want to or not. 
And so uh, when all of that is building up all over the world and then all of a sudden we have to contend with the war refugee problem, should that happen in Mexico? I just think that we would be stretched to the limits. But that's not why they came here to, to listen about. I just we Well, Larry, do you think if the winter had been a little shorter, you wouldn't be so gloomy? <laughs> I mean, you're sounding pretty yeah. dark well, here. That would have happened, yeah. I mean, a little spring weather spring might cheer, weather you, right would just cheer here. me right up. But, but I am concerned about it. I, I well, of course. I mean, it, it's, a, it's worth being concerned about. So, anyway, the topic for tonight, however, is, uh, yeah. Richard Francis. You know, Richard Francis Richard Burton Francis. never went to Mexico. Okay. He, was, he was everywhere. Everywhere else. He came to the United States, he came to Salt Lake City, he came to Utah. Um, when he was at loose ends, he wanted, he came to see what uh, the LDS church, what he wanted, he was interested in, in polygamy as a worldwide practice. And so he wanted to come to the United States because he was between sort of assignments and adventures and he just thought as a lark he would go meet Brigham Young and try to determine what the LDS phenomenon was because it seemed to him so interesting that I mean, he saw LDS as a polygamous cult. He did not see it as a religion that, ha that happened to have a polygamous factor in it. He saw it as polygamous right down to the core. You know, and so he wanted to come and investigate this. How in the, in the 19th century could a polygamous um, cult spring up and, 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 and why and under what circumstances and how was the rest of the culture reacting to it? So he, he came out, he didn't pass through North Dakota, but he got pretty close. He, he came through Lakota lands in Nebraska and wrote a really intelligent two-volume account of his trip to Utah. And he met uh, Brigham Young and they, they became friends. And then, you know, the thing about Burton is that everything he did wound up being a two-volume account. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, had, he was the writingest person that I've ever encountered in my whole life. I mean, he would, I'm going to go to Panama next week on this, now I'm not going after all this gloom, but, <laughs> but uh, I was going to Panama, but, uh, but you know, he, he, this is a 15-day trip, and he would write a book about this. He would take, every night he would write, you know, scores of pages of detailed notes about what the food was and what the weather was and who said what to whom and what the recreations on board were and, and what sightings of whales and dolphins and so on there were. I mean, he was a, a scribbler right down to the core and that everything he did almost in the whole course of his life wound up being published. Some of the books that he published and a few of them I've mentioned on the bibliography here, some of them are classics. So imagine that if everything you did for the rest of your life in a certain sense, became a book. That's Richard Francis Burton. Mm -hmm. 40, 40 published books. Yeah, and, there, and then his wife, I mean, his marriage, we're get, sort of getting ahead of ourselves a little yeah. bit here, but he was married to this really, really, really remarkable woman, Isabel Arundel. And you know, she had to be remarkable just to be married to such a person. I mean, it can't, it can't have been at all easy. And she was a Catholic and a very serious, um, pietistic Catholic, you know, a very much given to spiritual, spiritual life. And she, she was in awe of Richard Francis Burton, but she also didn't really appreciate his kind of relativism and his interest in religious practices all over the world. She wanted him to become a Christian, which he never did. And when he died in 1890, she found in his files manuscripts in every direction. You know, he was always beginning a book that never got finished. And she burned his diaries. And in burning his diaries, she committed one of the great crimes against, uh, against history. Because, you know, if you've ever heard of James Boswell's famous diaries, which, are, which were a scandal when they were discovered in the mid-20th century. He was an 18th century contemporary of Jefferson and, and Dr. Johnson. His journals, Boswell's journals, are considered amongst the most extraordinary in the world. Burton's diaries would have been equally compelling, and she was scandalized by some of the things she found in them. And so she simply burned them, and she burned a number of his manuscripts. 
And you know, she did it for her own good reasons, but as historians and lovers of culture, we have to really lament that because imagine what's in them. Okay, we did get ahead of, we've got him dead already. <laughs> Um, and we've got, <laughs> so let's back up a little bit. Sure. Why, don't we, why don't we start off, I know you've got a wonderful PowerPoint. I'm a little bit scared of this evening because not only do we have this wonderful PowerPoint, but Jim Carrey's gonna fit into the evening as well. Jim, so, the, the, yes, the Hollywood actor. The Jim Hollywood Carrey. actor. So this will be interesting to say the least, but so let's start off with big picture stuff. And, okay. and I know you've got well, this wonderful thing. I put this together. Um, I just wanted, I want people to get a sense of this man because you know, I've spent, I've had the great good fortune in my life, Larry, of being able to spend a lot of time with extraordinary individuals from history. Thomas Jefferson, a Renaissance man, and J. Robert Oppenheimer, a, a great genius, and Jonathan Swift, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Meriwether Lewis, and Roosevelt, and so on. And uh, my, my main academic work before I moved into the sort of, more, sort of a public life was on John Donne, the greatest preacher in British history, and I've just had this embarrassment of riches to play with. And then about two years ago, I sort of tripped into the world of Richard Francis Burton. And I have to say, and I hope that you will, I hope that you will take this to heart, I find, I, he is the most interesting historical personage that I have ever encountered or even heard about. And he, he is unendingly fascinating, sometimes troubling, as you know, but just unbelievably interesting. And so I just wanted to give people a sense of the range. You see the man, I mean, this is a, the, the look alone is mesmerizing. And by the way, he was a hypnotist, um, among many, many other things that he practiced. Um, so this is our conversation. That's a, a, the, the famous standard painting of Burton. Notice the scar, we'll come back to that. Here's a stylized version of it, but look at that. I mean, this is, uh, he, you know, one thing that will come out in this conversation that even though he was born British, the Brits never really could accept him. And there was a, there was a widespread rumor that he was maybe a gypsy. But they never, the Brits, you'll see a, a, a classical Brit in John Speak here in a minute, but the British establishment in the Victorian era was very stuffy and very proper and mannered and very um, tightly controlled. And Burton was this wild man, as his wife says here, he unites the wild, lawless creature and the gentleman. And the Brits just never really came to terms with him. And one of the reasons that he's a marginal character in British history is because he has this sort of exotic gypsy coloring. His eyes were black. He wore these long mustaches. He had that beautiful scar, which he didn't intend to get, but only served his interests once he had it. <laughs> this is a picture of him. It's not a very good resolution, but um, this, he, one of the things that, about Burton that you have to come to terms with immediately is that he was a master of disguise. For whatever psychological reason, he liked to dress up in disguises, and he did it all of his life, even when he didn't need to. He just enjoyed it, and so he was constantly dressing up like a foreign person, usually a person of the Orient. This is just a little map. You can see the resolution's not very good, but this was his, um, this was the trip to Mecca, the famous trip in 1853. Um, I'll come back to that. This is Harar, which is um, misspelled here, but, uh, but this is, this at the time was the, the sort of the Oxford, and Cambridge of the Islamic world in Africa. And this is the trip with John Speak in 1857 through nine from the coast to what he hoped was the source of the Nile River at Lake Tanganyika, which he discovered. This is Lake Tanganyika. Um, Burton discovered it, and let me just stop there, Larry, to say when we say discover, of course, we mean European discovery of something the natives uh, had already long since discovered uh, Lake Tanganyika. It's their name. It means the, um, the gathering of, of, of waters or the place from which the waters flow. And Arab merchants and slave traders had discovered these lakes. So the, the, this is part of the un, almost unbelievable Eurocentrism of the colonial era when 
a, a white British man happens upon a lake that's been known to Africa for millennia and known to the Arabs for hundreds and hundreds of years and then discovers it and names it. I mean, he, 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 Burton always liked to keep native names, so he kept Lake Tanganyika, but Speak discovered Lake Victoria and named it after the Queen. So here are the different Burtons. This is a famous photograph of Burton. Um, this is when he's older and a little more settled. Uh, writer, traveler, master of disguise, explorer, one of the world's greatest explorers, scholar. Um, his, his scholarship holds up very well in the 21st century. Linguist, as we've already said, he knew 29 languages. Think of that. He spoke 29 languages, and I'm not talking about, you know, a quick and dirty guide to Italian. Not getting by at a cafe somewhere. This is a man who spoke Arabic so perfectly that he could pass as an Arab. I mean, I don't know anyone who can do this sort of thing. He, he knew 29 languages, Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, Italian, German, etc. He knew Farsi. He, he knew modern Persian. He knew Hindustani. He knew 29 languages, and if you add up the dialects, it comes to something like 40. And I spent some time at Oxford, and at Oxford they have these exams. I never sat for them, but they will say, on such and such a date, um, you may sit for the Hindustani exam. And anyone who wants can walk in off the street and sign up and take the Hindustani exam or the Arab exam or whatever. And then it's a whole day long thing where you have to translate back and forth and speak and make literary appreciations. People literally spend a decade or more preparing for these exams. And Burton won first prize, first at Oxford and then in the British Army, on five or six separate occasions where he would study uh, Arabic for a year or a few months and walk in and get the first prize over people who had spent a decade studying Arabic. So he had some kind of a, a perfect natural genius for language acquisition. And, as you know, that's a very rare thing. Served him well. He was a diplomat. Um, he worked for the British consulate. He was a literary translator. He was uh, the, the two most famous translations, well, there are really three. Uh, the Lusiad, which is the Portuguese national epic, Camoens. He became fascinated by Camoens, who was, the, who was the Homer and the Virgil of Portugal. And he translated the Lusiads about African exploration. And he translated the a Thousand and One Arabian Nights, uh, which are just an immense piece of work. And his translation, although it's no longer used, was a pioneering translation in that all subsequent translations to the Arabian Nights are indebted to his footnotes and to his, um, his earthy mm -hmm. translations. You know, children read the Arabian Nights, and they've been cleaned up for children just as Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels is cleaned up for children. But the 1001 Arabian Nights is one of the raciest, most sexualized, bawdiest, most earthy books in the world. And Burton just loved that sort of thing. And he translated it with great gusto. So that's the, that's the second of his, of his great translations. And the third is he, he not only translated, but he discovered and translated the Kama Sutra. Now let me just stop for a moment on the Kama Sutra. I did not bring illustrations. <laughs> uh, you've all seen these illustrations. They're those sort of oriental pretzel-like <laughs> things. Uh, but, but the reason I, I mean, I didn't bring them for several reasons, wanting to protect your future for Thank one, you. but, Thank uh, you. <laughs> but, but also Burton had a very strong point to make about the Kama Sutra and other Eastern erotic texts. And here's the point. He was reacting against British Victorian mores. And he believed that the British and all highly civilized Europeans had sort of desexualized their cultures to the point that they were effectively sterile cultures. And he also believed that women in European civilization were degraded, uh, were oppressed and that they were systematically desexualized by the culture. And so he then looked to other cultures to see what their attitude was towards sensuality, sexuality, and women. 
And he found that Oriental cultures, or what we would call Asian cultures, were much more relaxed and were much more passionate. And so the, for him, the Kama Sutra is not a sex manual. That's what it is at a Barnes and Noble. <laughs> it was not a sex manual for, for Burton. It was a manual about how to love women. Because he believed, and, I, and he, there's good reason to, to, to agree with him, that these Oriental sexual treatises were not about um, ecstasy. They were about how to pleasure a woman in the broadest sense of the term pleasuring a woman, and that, that what Europeans needed to do was to learn how to, to treat women appropriately in and out of bed. And so he translated these not just as a, as a prurient thing. He's often called a Victorian pornographer. I don't think that that's fair at all. He, he was making a really strong political point about the subjugation of women in his own culture. And he was an anthropologist. His anthropology is still, some of it is considered the finest anthropology done of those tribes that he met in Africa and, and to a certain extent in South America. He is, I will acknowledge, a sexologist fascinated by sexual practices the world over. We can come back to that. But think of how wide this range is of this man. Um, this is a photograph taken of him as a young man. This is one of his first disguises. And this is his caption. And if you think of what a Victorian painting or photograph of a major Victorian figure looks like, you know, all dressed up and, and tightly wound and perfectly controlled and poised, he chose to be photographed this way. It's his way of saying, it's an ironic statement about civilization. It'd be, I mean, it'd be as if your official portrait as the president of Bismarck State was in a blanket. That's what he's saying. He's saying, how do you like that? You know. That's what I think of civilization. Uh, his dates are 1821 to 1890. This is the main focus of Burton's uh, travels. He traveled in South America. Uh, he traveled in North America. Uh, he traveled across Europe. But he never was into Russia or the Far East, Japan, China. He was in India, however. But Africa is really where he made his mark. And so I've just given you a little map here. Here's Mecca. Um, he was the first modern European. Let's see if I can get this right. He wasn't the first European to go to Mecca. But he was the first European to go fully in Islamic disguise to Mecca. You could only go to Mecca three ways if you're not Islamic. You was a prisoner. And many did. Uh, some died and some escaped. That's one way. You can convert to Islam, and that is very difficult because there's a lot of skepticism about whether your conversion is legitimate. But you can convert and go to Mecca, or you can go in disguise. And he was the first non-Mohammedan, non-Muslim, to go to Mecca in a full disguise, and he pulled it off. And just to give you a sense of this, if you get caught, it's not you know, an $80 fine. They kill you. you know, this, it was death to an infidel. And so if he had been exposed, he would at least have been roughed up and maybe tortured and probably killed. So it was the most daring feat of his life. That was early 1853, Medina and to Mecca. He wrote a famous book about it, which I have on your bibliography. In 1855, he was in Somaliland, or Somalia. That's where he got the scar. We'll come back to that. He was preparing for a mission into the interior, and he was attacked by tribesmen. And a spear literally went through his head. And a spear was thrown through his head. It entered one side of his face. It split his palate and took out four teeth and emerged on the other side of his face, but not fully. And he had to walk around with it for a while before it was extricated. Imagine that, Larry. I don't even, I don't even like root canal. <laughs> uh, in 1858, in the, in, in the famous expedition with John Speak, he, he penetrated from Zanzibar and Mombosa to Lake Tanganyika. And then his colleague Speak discovered, again, that's a loaded Eurocentric term, but discovered what we call Lake Victoria. This is John Speak. You remember the picture of Burton in his blanket? 
Here's his traveling companion, John Speak. This is a quintessential British explorer, gentleman, and army officer of the mid 19th century. This is Speak's official portrait. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. This is um, a sextant, a chronometer, his rifle. He was a famous hunter. And here is Ripon Falls and Lake Victoria. He discovered this, and he declared this to be the source of the Nile. But I, I have seldom seen a, a, a painting more beautiful than that one of a historical personage. And that's how Burton would have looked if he weren't a rebel. But that's Speak's portrait. Here's Aiden. The reason why it's, Aiden is important is this is where they recuperated after the trip into Lake Tanganyika. And it was here that the great controversy began, because just not to anticipate, but Burton decides to go search for the source of the Nile. Everyone's searching for the source of the Nile. Uh, David Livingston is searching for the source of the Nile. Others are searching for it. He takes John Speak as his lieutenant, as the British say, as his subordinate. And he and Speak go, and they have this incredible journey. It's almost unbelievable. They're sick. They nearly die. They have fevers. There are mutinies. There are, everything goes wrong that can go wrong. And for, for long periods of time, they are hovering on the edge of death. They're carried on litters by native tribesmen. These Europeans are, are, are within inches of death, and they're being carried to Lake Tanganyika. They get there, and Burton immediately believes, and, and Burton has he knows all of these languages, and he has studied Ptolemy, and studied Caesar, and studied Herodotus, and he knows everything there is to know about the historic search for the Nile. I mean, nobody in the world knows more than Richard Francis Burton about the, lo the long grail quest for the source of the Nile. And so they get to Lake Tanganyika, and he reckons that this is either the source of the Nile or somehow is a feeder of the source of the Nile. So, but he's just about dead. And so Speak, who's younger, recovers a little faster from his fever. And he says, you know, I've heard about this other lake. I think maybe just to while away the time, I'll walk up and see if I can find that other lake. And he goes 16 days, and he discovers Lake Victoria. And here's Speak, who knows only English. He doesn't know Herodotus. He hasn't done his history. He knows nothing. He's just a British guy. He bumbles into Lake Victoria and immediately says, I've discovered the source of the Nile. He goes back to Burton and says this. And Burton says, well, how do you know it's the source of the Nile? Did you walk around it? Did you find a river? How do you know? Speak says, I don't know. I just got this hunch. <laughs> That's it. I mean, and Burton is just appalled because he knows everything, and this guy knows nothing. And the guy is, is a monolinguist who can't even talk to the natives, whereas Burton would have you know, quizzed everybody. So they get back to Aden right here on the Saudi uh, Peninsula, the Arabian Peninsula. And Burton is ill, and so he's lingering in Aden, which is a British colonial outpost. And Speak goes back on an earlier ship to England. And as Speak, his subordinate and lieutenant, leaves, he says to Burton, don't worry, old chap. When I get to London, I won't do a thing until you get there. Uh, you can count on me. And so you know what happens. Uh, Speak gets back to England a few, a, about a week and a half before Burton. He goes immediately to the Royal Geographic Society and says, I, Speak, have discovered the source of the Nile. And Burton is dealt out of his fame. It'd be as if William Clark got a little jump on Lewis on their way back to St. Louis and said, look what I've done. And so this controversy rages for the next eight years and, and ends tragically. Uh, then I will go quickly now. Uh, Burton was posted to Fernando Po as a minor diplomat. He, he was in Damascus for two years. That was his coveted um, consulship. Uh, his wife cost him that job. Uh, then he wound up in the last years of his life in Trieste, which is on the Yugoslav-Italian border. I've been to Trieste. It's one of the world's kind of most interesting pivot cities, and he spent this whole period, um, writing books and translating the Arabian Nights in, in Trieste. It was essentially a sinecure. Uh, this is what he looks like in his prime. He's a very beautiful man. Um, and this is what he said, the man wants to wander, and he must do so, or he shall die. And this is his diary. I love this moment. 
one of the gladdest moments in human life, methinks, is the departure upon a distant journey into unknown lands, shaking off with one mighty effort the fetters of habit, the leaden weight of routine, the cloak of many cares, and the slavery of home. Man feels once more happy. The blood flows with the fast circulation of childhood, a fresh dawns, the morn of life. He's, Burton is very florid in his writing, as you can see, but he's, it's beautiful. So these are, we've just gone over these. Mecca and Medina, 1853. This is what established his reputation. He then goes to Harar in, what, in today's Ethiopia, which is the Sorbonne of African Islam. That's 1854, very dangerous mission, which he does more or less alone. 1855, when they're on the coast of Somaliland, attacked by tribesmen, that was the spear to the face. Um, and, and John Speak was badly injured there too. 1857 to 9, the search for the source of the Nile, that ends in that controversy. And then it, it has to be said that one of the great adventures of, of Bert, Burton's life was marrying Isabel Arundel. This was an odd, strange, hard to figure out marriage, but it worked in some sense. And they were both extremely remarkable people. He was, he was what we've already said, but she was a woman in some respects who was as interesting as he was, and she went on to become the keeper of his flame. Just to go through those again once more, this is Mecca, this is the Kaaba, this is the famous cube at the center of Mecca. When Burton was there, it wouldn't be quite that fancy, but he did manage to get in it, and he took secret notes, Larry. It was death to write notes. So he would go in as the Sunni Arab and do everything right, his gestures, his prayers, his intonations, he knew everything. And he would take with him, he, had, he, was, he was traveling as a kind of a doctor, as a, as a kind of a medi medicine man. And he would have these small sheets of paper that he would palm. And he would wait till no one was looking. Remember, it's death if they catch him. And he'd wait till no one looking, then he'll say, 17 feet by 12 feet, uh, <laughs> guy with a big beard and a sword. You know, and then, and then he would take these after the, and he would, he, would, he would squirrel these out of there, and then he would roll them up like this, and he would number them, and he would put them in these little medicine bottles that he was carrying. And when he got back to Aden, then he puts these all out, and he reassembles his notes, from which he writes this two-volume classic <laughs> of this trip. But if he had been caught, last note he ever wrote. Here's Harar, very bad photograph, but this is this sacred citadel in what's now Ethiopia. Here's the, the, the attack, he got that scar, and that became sort of his badge. This, I'm sorry to say, I found on the internet, uh, but, but this is the actual source of the Nile, right back in here, and this is the signage, this is like at Lake Itasca. And who's the spam guy? I thought that was your brother, Ferg. <laughs> Some knucklehead is going around to famous places on Earth with a spam can. Hey, it worked. But I thought it was kind of cute, Larry, because there's that monument. It turns out that Lake Victoria is not the source of the Nile. It's sort of the, it's like, it's like up at Itasca, or it's like where Lewis and Clark found the source of the Missouri. There is no source of anything because when you get to the upper end of a river system, it creates a capillary action, and there are hundreds, maybe thousands, of little rivulets that serve as the source. And so the nominal source of the Mississippi is Lake Itasca. The nominal source of the Missouri is the upper Red Rocks lakes in, on the Montana-Wyoming border. The nominal source of the Nile is Lake Victoria, but the actual source of the Nile is in today's Oh, Uganda, Rwanda Highlands was discovered by satellite in the 1980s and through watershed analysis. And this marks the, a more precise spot of the source of the Nile. And people flock to it the way they do to Itasca. And this knucklehead has nothing better to do with his life than to do spam blogs from around the world. But I thought you'd want to see that this yeah. is a big tourist attraction. And I mean, there were times when Burton would have killed anybody to get to some spam, I'm sure. This is Isabel, married in 1861. Extraordinary woman. I mean, she wrote a multi-volume biography of Burton, which is still one of the great reads that you will ever undertake if you have that much patience. Uh, these are the, the lesser adventures. India. Um, we'll come back to the brothels in Karachi. The Crimean War. 
the Mormonism of recon in Salt Lake City in 1860. And here's his intellectual output, Larry, 40 books, including classics, 29 languages. He mastered Islam to the point of being able to pass. He translates the Kama Sutra and the 1001 Arabian Nights. And he wrote, he was a master of fencing, a world champion fencer. And he also wrote a book on the history of the bayonet, which the British Army later adopted. And he wrote the still best book on the history of swords and sword play in the world. Also a book on falconry. This is a man who had uh, unbelievable curiosity. There's a, 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 an engraving of him. Here's a famous portrait of him in his um, disguise as an Arab trader. This is from Punch magazine. Later in life, during the Trieste-Damascus years, they're making a little fun of him. Um, this is another uh, satire on Burton from Punch. Here's his wife. Was, I, wish, I wish I could have met both of them, but in some sense, she might even be more interesting than he. This is his tombstone in London. After he died, she had this mausoleum built for him um, in the shape of the, the uh, rotai tents that um, safari leaders used. That's his tomb. She's in there, too. Here it is from another angle. This poor community had to absorb this <laughs> monument. Uh, there she is. A, it's a nice portrait of her. There she is in looking more like a classical Victorian. And this is what she said. I just love this. This is, if you, know, if you, if you ever need, I, I know neither one of us will probably ever do this, but if you, this is a great description of like a, for a want ad, for like <laughs> match.com, you know? Here's what she said in her diary. To me, there are three kinds of marriage. First, worldly ambition. Uh, that is marriage for fortune, title, estate, society. Very important in Britain at this time. Secondly, love. That is the usual pig and cottage. You know, that's most of us, Larry, you know, face it. Pig and cottage means, you know, so Rambler style house in Bismarck or Mandan. <laughs> and thirdly, which is my ideal of being a companion and wife, a life of travel, adventure and danger, seeing and learning with love to glorify it, that is what I seek. She wanted an adventurer, and my goodness, did she find one. And she says this too. This is, um, I think, very telling. I worship ambition. By ambition, I mean men who have the will and power to change the face of things. Men like you, Larry. Um, I wish I were a man, says Isabel Burton. If I were, I would be, sorry, I would be Richard Burton. But as I am a woman, I would be Richard Burton's wife. I love him purely, passionately, and devotedly. There is no void in my heart. It is at rest forever with him. A beautiful tribute. There's, to give you a sense of proportion, there's America swallowed up in Africa. And then, I, that's the end, Larry. I just wanted to linger on this image because I think this is sort of, even though it's cartoony, this is a, encapsulates who Richard Francis Burton was. So there's a, there's a brief overview. <laughs> yeah. uh, it beats our okay. endless talk on yeah, Mexico. Yeah, yeah, no. No, yeah that's yeah, true. Yeah. That's true, it does. Um, Okay, thank you, and, and uh, it obviously he's a fascinating man. Um, how would you compare him to Thomas Jefferson? Because I know that you're... Jefferson knew Jefferson. seven languages, and he was, um, you know, Jefferson would never have camped out. And Jefferson was not interested in human anthropology. Jefferson was a philosopher. I mean, Jefferson is a polymath, and he's a, and he's a Renaissance man, but Jefferson is a very, is a typical... 18th century, highly civilized gentleman. Um, there's really almost no resemblance to someone like Burton. I mean, Burton was engaged in so many adventures that were just utterly reckless. I mean, he was in, he would wander into these tribes where he'd be held effectively under house arrest for months. And they would decide every morning whether to kill him or not. And he would slowly become so fascinated by the culture that was holding him prisoner that they would become fascinated by him, and they would let him go because they came to admire him. But he was, there's, he's a romantic right to the core, and Jefferson is not. And he is a, he's a genius in a way that Jefferson is not. I mean, there are certain superficial resemblances. Jefferson is often seen as this extraordinary man because he knew seven languages, but 
I mean, when you get to 29, you are really in the top whatever it is, one half of one half of one half of one percent of anyone who ever lived on Earth. Mm -hmm. okay. let's, let's start and go through this whole thing chronologically, if okay. we could, then. Let's, and, and then we can sort of relax a little bit in some of this stuff. I know you went through some of this pretty fast, and yet it's really fascinating stuff. I just stuff. want to give people an overview because yeah. they'll want to read on their own, of course. Of course. Uh, so let's go back, starting with his childhood. Okay. And the travel and the, the sense that he never felt British, and you've already sort of made reference to that, but let's just talk about his childhood. His father was an, was an Anglo-Irish army officer who married a, a woman of considerable wealth and station. And they were in Italy, and he was called upon to uh, join King George IV's legal prosecution of his wife, Caroline, who uh, he was prosecuting her for adultery. And uh, it's not true that she was committing adultery, but the king wanted to ruin this wife. And Burton's father had met her and worked a little in her sort of entourage, and he knew that she was a woman of virtue. And so he refused to cooperate with the royal investigation of the king's, um, of the queen. And because of that, he was cashiered. And so then he was on half pay for the rest of his life, and the family wandered around. They lived for a few years here and a few years there, mostly on the continent. And so Burton, I think, lived in nine different places before he was 10 years old in Europe. And so he was this sort of wanderlust, this idea that there's no home, there's no root, there's no stability, I think was central to his character and surely had something to do with that crazy upbringing. Okay. The relationship with his mother and particularly relative to her father and some inheritance. And and, yeah, it's a strange story, but I mean, he, he, his relations with women generally are very complex and thick. But his mother, you know, this is all about Victorian systems of inheritance, and his mother had a chance to inherit a fair amount of money, a fortune, really. And for odd reasons, she chose not to and let it go to the other side of the family. And Burton always resented this. I mean, the thing about Burton was that he would have been so, well, this is where he is like Jefferson, both of them would have been so much better off if they were wealthy, because they behaved like wealthy men and they wanted to do what wealthy people can do, but they never had anything, really. And so Burton is constantly clawing for cash through his life, publishing books in part just to put food on the table. And Jefferson wouldn't have published, but for the same reasons was constantly cash starved. And so Burton really resented that his mother had not protected his side of the family in whatever happened in that, in that inheritance thing. Okay. And then his brother Edward? His brother Edward was also in the Indian part. Army. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I didn't. No, I was just to say, it, uh, from what I've read, is Edward played an important part of, in his life, and I was just wondering if you could. Edward, uh, Burton and Edward couldn't really fit into British society, and so both of them wound up in India. And this was what happened at this time. If you, if you couldn't really fit, if you were the third, fourth son, or if you had trouble at Oxford or whatever, you wound up going off into the colonial service in some way. In India, the Raj was at its height during this period, and so both of them wound up in um, India. That's, uh, Burton spent seven years in India before he started all the things we've been talking about, and he established his linguistic career there. That's how he uh, found advancement in the, in the Raj, by mastering all these local dialects and languages. Became an important spy, we think, for Sir Charles Napier, who was the British overlord military overlord of, of some parts of India during this period. And so Burton had gone off to the Indian Army. His brother was a more traditional soldier. And Burton was always getting himself in terrible trouble uh, because he was almost always right. But he was always, he lacked discretion. And so he predicted the Indian mutiny a few years before it happened. And when it, and because he predicted a mutiny, he was demoted. And then when it happened, exactly when he said it was going to happen, and for the reasons that he had predicted, he was demoted again. So he's demoted for predicting it, and then he's demoted when it turns out that he was absolutely right. This is how the British Army worked in those days. I guess that's how the Army works anywhere. <laughs> but, you know, he, so his, his insights were never taken seriously. And his brother, 
was in, Burton by now was in Africa, but his brother was in India during the mutiny, and his brother was psychologically damaged, and he spent the rest of his life in asylums, and never spoke again. He came back to England after the mutiny, and he literally, for the last 40 years of his life, never spoke a sentence, except very late when somebody, just to mess with him, said, hey, I don't think you ever paid back that five pound note. And he said, I did too pay that back, and then he went silent again for the rest of his life. <laughs> but he was psychologically damaged. He was yeah. post-traumatic stress syndrome for the Indian mutiny, and that really upset Burton, you know, that his brother had been, mm -hmm. uh, had been damaged so deeply by all of this. Yeah. His ability to see that the Indian mutiny was going to occur, and, and of course the way he is ostracized for that or demoted and got into a lot of trouble, what does that say about his sensitivity to the cultures that he lived in versus what the rest of the British officers were doing? You no, know, that's a really and good, speak, good question. Think, speak same. couldn't do it. Speak, yeah. speak was cut off because he was monolingual, and he also was cut off by his British arrogance, whereas Burton Burton was an infiltrator, and so what he would do when he got to a new society was to try to figure out how to get at the center of it. How do you learn the society? He knew you couldn't learn it from the outside looking in. You had to get into it, and he had a number of strategies for this that are, are quite interesting, but he always did this. He learned the language, and he listened. He would go to the bazaars and sit in the coffee houses and sit in the, the um, he would smoke hashish with the local people, and he would go to the whatever the, the kind of the poorest quarter of Cairo was, or Alexandria, or Karachi, or Bombay. He would always go into the, the worst slums and stay there, and kind of wander around and listen and find people who could teach him the language. And he would, he would learn these things. And because he was willing to do this, he was a natural sensualist. And I, I, that's why I object to his being called a a sexualist because, I mean, he was interested in sex to a point, but he was really a sensualist, by which I mean he wanted to know how coffee is ground and he wanted to know how prayers are done and how a bed is made and so on. And so he would get right to the center of these cultures and just absorb like a sponge. And so because of that, he heard things that British Army officers didn't hear. We just saw this in Iraq. I mean, this, everyone must be thinking this, that in Iraq, we, one of the reasons why the Iraq debacle has been such a horrible one for the United States is we had so few people who knew the culture. We went in with a really, uh, a really a fundamental arrogance without knowing the culture. And the people who got to know the culture in Iraq frequently came back. They were often, as you know, ranking officers. They would come back and they would try to report this to the Defense Department or to the President or sometimes to the public. And they were, many of them were demoted for this because they were telling us truths that we didn't particularly want to hear. And Burton would go even farther than that. He would go in and he would listen. He'd say, these people are getting ready to have a mutiny. You know, I'm hearing it. Where someone like Speak would only be able to talk through an interpreter and the interpreters were frequently telling them what they expected or wanted to hear. And so Burton had this capacity all of his life and sometimes he took it too far. But it's what made him a great anthropologist, because a great anthropologist is somebody who, who surrenders his own ego and his own software, or hers, to the point of being able to hear things that, through my ego, I couldn't hear because they would get distorted through that lens. Mm -hmm. So he managed to put on the lens of the local that the other British officers were incapable or had no desire to. They had no I desire, suppose. and if you look at the... I've torn this up. If you look at the front page of the... <laughs> I've got one here. Which one are you looking at? at the, I have it here. It's a, at the front page of the Skogan Jenkinson Follies handout. <laughs> this, this from Dane Kennedy's Highly Civilized Man. Uh, let me just quickly read it. This, I think this tells you a lot of, this sort of summarizes where we are so far anyway. But, and I'm going to use a bad word at the end of this. But there is little doubt, says Dane Kennedy, that this sense of self was ambivalently situated vis-a-vis -vis England. Um, Burton sought the recognition of his countrymen, all of his books are published there, for example, but saw a little prospect of attaining it through conventional avenues. Instead, he began to conceive for himself a more audacious path to glory, one more consistent with his emotional appetites, intellectual abilities, and social limitations. 
Uh, he embraced his own sense of difference, claiming a position outside the boundaries of class and custom, fashioning a public persona that obeyed no authority but its own critical intelligence. You know, that's always a social mistake, obeying no authority but its own critical intelligence. That might have integrity, but it never works socially. This assertion of independence hinged on his willingness to wander, I love this phrase, his willingness to wander the edges of the earth, to investigate strange societies and explain their unfamiliar ways, to speak uncomfortable truths, even at the risk of being labeled a white nigger. And he was. He was always accused of going native and, and going over to the other side and identifying too closely with these subject peoples. Someone like Speak would literally not allow himself to be touched by a black man or would not allow himself to be served under certain circumstances. There was such a, a, a race caste system and so much cultural arrogance in the, in the colonial world, including our own, that these officers were basically paralyzed by it. And they, instead of appreciating Burton for this capacity that he had, which few of us have, they blamed him for going native instead. And so today he would get a much better chance. We have, we're less uptight than the Victorians were in this one regard. But would he, look, in, in that process, would he look at the natives as equals to him? Well, he, that's a very complex question. He, I mean, he looked down on Africans as, he, he was a polygenicist. You know, there are two types of basic anthropology. One is the monogenicist view that we were all born from Adam and Eve and we branched out and the racial distinctions sort of happened over time and diffusion. And then there's the polygenesis view that humans were born in all over the world and not just from the Garden of Eden and that because of that, there can be some serious differentiations within the species Homo sapiens. And he belonged to the polygenesis view, and he believed all of his life that Africans were, that black Africans were inferior. He wasn't as bad as, say, someone like Thomas Jefferson, who was a true racist. Burton was more, he was curious in a way, and he had lots and lots of relationships with black tribes, people, individuals, women, and so on. He, he was not a racist in the sense of Alabama in 1960 or 1940, but he, was, he did believe in, in, in black inferiority. On the other hand, he, was, he had a lifelong admiration and love affair with Arab culture. He believed that Arabs were a very extraordinary people, and he felt deep reverence for Arabs except the slave trade. And he, he, there's a, as you know, you've, you've read these biographies, there's a lively debate about whether he actually became Islamic. Instead of just disguising himself as a Muslim, there's some reason to believe he actually preferred Islam and gave his affiliation to Islam. But whatever it is, he, he had this love affair with Arab culture, and when he would be in Africa, they'd be, you know, tribe after tribe after tribe of very frustrating encounters where they're basically being robbed by local tribesmen for the purpose of, for the privilege of passing through their territory. And then they would come upon Arabs, even Arabs who were taking slaves to the coast. And Burton would immediately relax. And then he would have these long, intense conversations with these Arabs, which he regarded as equals or superiors. So it's, comp it's a complex mm -hmm. issue. Okay. Uh, let's go back to India for a little bit, because that's where he first got into trouble, is in India. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, you had mentioned the, the issue of integrity. It seems to me that what we see throughout his life, and Speaks fits into this as well, is that people have promised him things, and then he gets in trouble because they don't live up to their promise, just as Speak promised him, and the general promised him he'd keep this report. Uh, yeah, Charles Napier was everybody. this very brusque, um, kind of Napoleonic or Caesarian figure in the Raj. And the British Home Office was always a little concerned about him because he did a lot of freelancing and, and sort of treated himself as a proconsul rather than a British civil servant. And he liked Burton and Burton liked him. And there was a problem in India. These officers were sexually starved in this alien culture and there were not ever enough British women 
in India. And so these officers would frequent prostitutes, and they almost all had concubines and morganatic relationships with local women and so on. This was just allowed, you know, just accepted, frowned on, but accepted. And, but Napier had the view that these officers were going to male brothels where they were having sexual relations with Indian and Pakistani boys, and that this was enervating them, that was weakening them both physically through STDs and so on, but also enervating their moral character. A little sexist, you know, that female prostitution, no great problem. Male prostitution, death of England. But that's how they saw it. Mm. So he gets Burton, who's this like master of disguise, this great infiltrator, and who's curious. He says, I want you to infiltrate these male brothels in Karachi, which is now in Pakistan, then it was in India. He says, I want you to infiltrate these male brothels and, and, and write a report, and I promise you that that report will never come back to haunt you. And so for, this is where it gets a little dicey, because for 18 months, Burton did this. And so, of course, the question that automatically comes to mind is, how do you infiltrate a male brothel system for 18 months without engaging in the activities that are there? You can't sit around and smoke tobacco. You know, you, <laughs> if you go to these places, you're not going to be allowed to just say, well, I thought I, the coffee shops are closed. I thought I'd hang out at a male brothel. So, so just what just he actually notes, did yeah. in these things is, is unclear. There's, there's no real evidence that Burton was bisexual or homosexual, but this stuck with him for the rest of his life. And Napier was recalled, and his successors leaked to get rid of Burton. Everyone was always trying to get rid of Burton. They leaked this report to the other officers, and the other officers naturally never, ever, ever forgave Burton for outing them. And then he was, he was saddled with this albatross of maybe homosexual for the rest of his life. And so this, this created the Burton myth. The Burton myth is that he's a super sexed guy who was constantly crossing boundaries into sexual worlds that he had no business in and, and shaming the British colonial establishment. I don't think there's any particular evidence to suggest that that's true, but that's the rap. Okay, and that's how he got in trouble in India. That's I mean, that one of the ways, yeah. I mean, okay. it, 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 there were others, but that was the main one. So now this follows him for the rest of his life. Yeah. yeah. So how does he end up going to Mecca? And we're in India, and then you he know, goes his back next to great. He goes back to Britain for yeah. a while, three years, and lives with his mother and sister. And then he's been scheming this for a long time that he wanted to penetrate Mecca. And it was, I mean, I, I can't even, it's hard to find an analogy in our world that would be sufficiently dangerous. But it's, it's a really, really crazy thing to do. I mean, it'd be as if you and I decided to go to Baghdad or Tehran and disguise ourselves as Sunnis. We'd be outed within seconds, <laughs> you know? I mean, just imagine this. And here's this guy who's actually going to go into this culture where to be found out is death. And the only way he can, you know, this is not just language, Larry. The language is one thing, and he was, he was, he was a perfect speaker of Arabic. He memorized most of the Quran. He memorized it in Arabic. And he became a kind of a learned doctor. He, became, he was regarded as a philosopher of, of Islam. But in addition to that, he had to learn the mannerisms and I don't really understand this, but people who know something about this do, that you have to eat in a certain way, you have to urinate in a certain way, in a certain posture, you have to look people in the eye in a certain way, you, you adjust your clothing in a certain way. It's all ritual. Now, we live in a casual culture where that, none of that really matters very much, but this is a culture then, and even to a certain degree now, where every time you adjusted your clothing or the way you put your sash on, was a sign whether you were authentic or not. And he had to master this. And a single slip could be the death of him, and he was able to do it. It's a form of mimicry and, of course, cultural appreciation that is staggering. 
and he pulled it off. When he got, when he, that's the, it's called the Hajj, and he made this journey, and he got to Mecca, and there were, the, the adventure is crazy. There were snipers, and there were incidents, and people dropping dead of dehydration, and this is an ordeal. This is not like a, you know, like a trip to New Orleans. And on the way back, he somehow, he had this, well, this Islamic valet that was traveling with him, and on the way back, he, it appears that he urinated thinking he was not being observed while standing up. And in an Islamic culture, then at least, you urinate squatting. And this, this Islamic boy came to him and said, I knew you were a fake. And then Burton moved much more quickly to get, <laughs> to get out of the harm's way. But so he almost pulled it off. And then this, very interestingly, this young man who had really admired Burton now saw that he was a Frank. Frank was a kind of a general term for a European. And now he said, you've shamed us. You've shamed our culture. So they took that very, very seriously. And, but Burton then goes away and writes this book about it. And then a year later, he goes to the Sorbonne of Africa at Harar. So, he, so this thing of disguising himself, being able to pass, is of deep fascination to him for some reason. It's not just cultural appreciation. It's somehow pulling off the disguise. There's an incident, if I can find it, that I find fascinating, where he, um, he, he does this on a boat, where he's, he, he does this on a boat when he, he's, he's done with this trip, and he, he pull, he's on a boat with other British officers, and he's pretending to be, yeah. you remember reading yeah. this? He's yeah. pretending to be an Arab. And so he's, he's wearing a full Arab costume, and he looks Arabic, and he's on this boat, and he, these are British officers that he knew in India, and he's walking past them, back and forth and back and forth, and they're ignoring him because he is a, an end, you know, for them. And finally, he brushes up against his old friend. And his old friend says, if you do that again, Ann, I'll kill you. And then Burton looks him in the eye, and the guy says, oh, it's Ruffian Dick. And, and Burton does this just for fun. I mean, he, he could have gotten hurt or killed, but, but he, he likes this idea of passing in disguises. It's central to his character. And where that comes from, I don't have any idea. Now, one place he didn't have to have a disguise was the Crimea. Goes to the so. Crimean War, wants to see action. As you know, the, if you've ever read the Light Brigade, uh, the Crimean War is one of the great disasters in British military history, just a debacle. And the reason that it was a debacle is because they were, uh, the, arm, the British officer corps was gentlemen who bought their positions but had no actual military merit. And Burton is just the kind of person to see through this instantly. And he goes to the Crimean War and nothing good happens, and it, it turns out to be a lost episode in his life, but he's there at the same time as Florence, Florence Nightingale, and this is, of course, the this, this famous war between Russia and Turkey with Britain sort of as the intermediary. Mm -hmm. And Isabel plays into... She wanted to go. She's this, you know, she said, I wish I were a man, and she meant it. She wanted to go off and join Florence Nightingale, and Florence Nightingale said no. And so Isab Isabel wants to be an adventurer in, a, in, a, in an age when women have so few avenues of adventure today you know, she would have many different ways of expressing her own great spirit. In her own time, she was straitjacketed by Victorian culture and never, she had to, in a certain sense, to live through her husband because she couldn't establish her own style. Okay, so up to this point, we've got a guy that's lived in India and gone through all the episodes there. He's been to Mecca. Uh, he's been to the Crimean War, but that's not what he's remembered for. Of course, what he's remembered for is Africa. It's the Nile. So now we'll, we'll get him to Africa and talk a little bit about how he got there. And I know you've already sort of alluded to this, but let's talk some more about the hardships in Somalia and and speak. And, and I know we're going to get ahead of ourselves a little bit because it happens a little bit later, but... Let's talk about uh, uh, Livingston and the debate and what happens to speak. And Livingston is, of course, the famous African missionary, Scottish. And he's been there from before Burton gets there, and he's there long after Burton leaves. Livingston, the famous incident that we all know about, 
Dr. Livingston, I presume, by Henry Morgan Stanley, who's an American, occurred well after Burton's episodes in Africa were over forever. And, Bert, and, and Livingston, who, had done, who was just regarded as a, as a human saint by the British world, had always traveled alone, and he never had a military escort, and he would wander as a beggar, and things just always worked out magnificently for him. He was the first to cross the entire continent east to west. He later did it west to east. He did great explorations in the Zambezi, and, but he was a missionary, essentially. And, and wrote these fabulous accounts that made him a world historical figure. Um, so late in life, his, he was sort of running out of steam, and his reputation was beginning to decline a little. And so he, too, joined the quest to find the source of the Nile. And he wound up more or less where Burton had been in 1857 and 8 at, at Ujiji, which is on Lake Tanganyika. And it's there at Ujiji that Henry Morgan Stanley found him. That was a newspaper stunt. Uh, and he was sent there uh, by Bennett, the great newspaperman from New York. And Stanley went to self-consciously to find the lost Livingston. There's a wonderful book about it on your list called Into Africa, which is a magnificent book about this whole episode. But at any rate, Livingston is doing much the same thing. Then Stanley finds him, and nobody has yet found the source of the Nile. Speak has claimed it, but it's widely discounted because he only spent three days at Lake Victoria, did no reconnaissance, he had no science, no linguistic skills, and so it's regarded as a kind of a feat. So then Livingston tries to do it. He can't do it. You know, who finally does it is Stanley. It's, it's Henry Morgan Stanley who solves the problem by circumnavigating Lake Victoria and discovering that out of the northern end of Lake Victoria at Ripon Falls is the nominal source of the Nile. That settles the issue, and Stanley gets the credit. Turns out he's wrong, too, from a modern satellite point of view, but that was the, the solution to the problem in the 19th century. So all of these different people are searching for the source of the Nile. All contemporaries. And Burton wants to do it. And Burton is probably, of all of them, the most learned, the one who has the deepest awareness of, we're running out of steam. Um, he has the deepest awareness of the history of the thing, the geography of the thing, the native cultures. I mean, Burton is the, is the intellectual Superman of this story, but he is a marginal figure, as I think we've already established, and he makes this terrible, terrible mistake by asking John Speak to serve as his lieutenant. And Speak turns out to be a real scoundrel and trumps Burton. And they get into the, I just want to tell the end of the story because it's so interesting. So they go to, they almost die, they go to Lake Tanganyika. Burton is, is really ill, Speak is a little less ill, Speak goes off and discovers Lake Victoria, races home and tells the British establishment, gets the credit, they fit out a second expedition, he refuses to take Burton with him, deals Burton out of the whole story, and the debate that, that gets started between them, there are Speakites who advocate Speak because he looks so beautiful and he's a British establishment guy and kind of he's truly English, and then there are Burtonites who think, I don't really like this guy very much, but he's brilliant. And so these, the, the British, the, Brit, the learned world in Britain, and to a certain extent in, on the continent in America, side with one or the other of them. And this debate, it's, even, it's, it's impossible to place this in a context that would make sense in the 21st century, because the life of the mind is not, you know, it's not quite that big a deal in our world, but this was, the, this was a, this was like a grudge match between two points of view and two ways of British um, culture and society, and everything was at stake. So finally, they go back and forth. They're, they're writing letters to the London Times, and they're each publishing monographs in which they do damage to each other's reputation, and it's just horrible. And no one can get this thing settled. And so finally, in 1864, the British establishment says, enough, eight years of this debate. We're going to have a clash of titans at Bath, at Bath. And so they set this up. And the, Bath is this sort of, sort of Chautauqua center, or this cultural convening center in southern England. And 
the entire British geographic and intellectual establishment descends on Bath to hear the debate between Speak and Burton. 2,000 people. And the person who's going to moderate is David Livingston, the saint. And he hates Burton for <laughs> Burton's character, but he secretly sides with Burton's mental superiority and his better geography. And so he's an impartial moderator, but he is basically a Burtonite, and even though he doesn't like Burton. So the day comes, it's on your list of the, I have the list of the, in your handout of these key dates in Burton's life. This is um, September 16th, 1864, so our Civil War is starting to wind down a little in the United States. This event takes place at Bath in England in these beautiful neoclassical conference rooms, 2,000 people, and Burton shows up right on time at 11 a.m. for the noon debate. Livingston is there, and noon comes, just like the session between us, and no speak. And the crowd gets a little restless and wonders where speak is, and time passes, and time passes, and Burton is fidgety, and suddenly a note is passed to the moderator, and the moderator says, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but John Speak is dead. A day earlier, the, the afternoon before, Speak went hunting. He, he, he had a friend in the area, and they went hunting on the, that man's estate. Now, this is where the controversy begins, but apparently John Speak, who was one of the world's best and most careful hunters, was climbing up a stone wall and pulling his shotgun after him, it discharged and blew a hole in his chest from which he died about 15 minutes later. So the controversy rages to this day. I mean, you can imagine that this controversy can still have flames, but it rages to this day, Larry, about whether Speak committed suicide to avoid the confrontation with the much, much better prepared Burton or he had a freak accident on that wall. And there are people who argue both sides with great violence. At any rate, here's the upshot. Here's why Burton can never catch a break. <laughs> He's sitting there. He's going to win the debate. The news comes in, and the crowd blames him <laughs> and, and believes that he drove speak to suicide. So here he's, he is absolutely innocent of this, but the crowd sides with their blonde, typical British colonial officer and against the gypsy. And so, yeah, poor, poor Burton. And so the debate doesn't happen. Yeah. Burton gives, gives a talk, but he gives a talk on something else, some tribe he met somewhere, but he, he, tries, he, he does the gracious thing and doesn't, doesn't debate the thing. Do you think it's that coincidental that Speak, I mean, the, the day before they had met and Speak was very agitated and in fact stormed out of their pre-debate meeting and uh, you know, there were comments about how agitated he was that day and then that was like one, one in the afternoon and by four in the afternoon he's, he's dead. dead. Well, you know, what can you say about something like this? I mean, it, it, there are several possibilities. It could have been an accident. I mean, literally, just accidents happen. Freud would say accidents actually don't happen. Accidents are, there's a cross between accident and intentionality that we have a hard time fathoming. But it could have been an accident. It could have been suicide. I doubt that it was suicide. It, it could have been actual suicide, like I'm now gonna blow a shotgun into my chest or I'm gonna be really reckless and wind up killing myself here. It could be two types of suicide. He clearly was deeply agitated. I mean, uh, Burton is no saint, as I think we've established, but he was arrogant, he was thin-skinned, he was a swashbuckler, he was a boundary crosser, and there are lots of problems with the, the, the life and personality of Richard Francis Burton. But Burton had absolute intellectual integrity. Speak did a really rotten thing by trying to trump Burton after promising that he wouldn't. 
and he was the William Clark of the story. He wasn't the Meriwether Lewis of the story. He was clearly the second guy. Um, you know, it would be as if Buzz Aldrin claimed that he had been the first on the moon. It, doesn't, it just doesn't hold up. And Speak also tr mistreated all of his subordinates, including on the second mission to the Nile. He frequently failed to pay debts to native porters. He um, always belittled people who had been essential to his successes. I mean, Speak is just a bad guy in many respects. He has bad character. Burton has a flamboyant, um, boundary-testing character, but he doesn't have a bad character. It's just that's who he is. But Speak is really kind of a schnook. And so for Speak, who, is, who really is intellectually a lightweight, admitted he couldn't write, told Burton the only reason he wanted to go on the mission was to hunt. For him to do this thing is one of the great outrages in the history of ideas. And you know, it may have been that Speak's sense of self-division over this thing just took over that afternoon. But imagine the tension. I mean, even if leaving out guilt and anything else, just the sheer tension of 2,000 of the, of the most important people in Britain coming to watch this debate. As you know, you can have a good night or a bad night in anything, in tennis or in, in debate. And the tension alone might have been enough for him to get careless. I found Speak an incredibly easy guy to dislike. I'm glad for that. I thought you were going to be like a Speakite. No. <laughs> no. No. You disliked uh, him. He is dislikable. He's dislikable. What's uh, the most dislike dislikable thing about him? That he killed just to kill. And what did he do when he killed? He ate oh. fetuses of animals. But he would kill an elephant and then of a pregnant elephant and then eat the fetus. And the natives were just appalled by this. And Burton was too. He would kill antelope and eat the fetus. He'd kill a zebra and eat the fetus. And Burton said, you know, what is wrong with you? A, that you have to kill, but B, that you would, you know, this is like a taboo, some deep taboo of eating. I mean, it's hard enough to eat veal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Um, and there's talk about him, in fact, there, uh, there's talk about him uh, having a death wish, that he went to Africa he said to he, die. He said he told he said, Burton, I came here to die. Came here to die. And so he went there with a death wish, wish and, uh, and nearly did and just wantonly killed Can you tell the, the ear incident just for fun? The what? The ear? Speak Go ahead. The, tell no, me. you. Well, I'd, I'd have to find it to read it. All I right. know you know. Okay. Well, they're on this. I mean, you can't even believe this journey. This makes Lewis and Clark look like a Sunday school picnic. At every turn, they're dying of this or that. They get malaria. All the porters run off. They steal everything. They're attacked by this and that. Oh, I want to show that piece of film, too. We've got to get this. this yeah, set. I was wondering. You said, dear. Yeah, we've got to get this to work. Uh, uh, but I want to show that because it's hilarious. But So they're almost always dying, I mean, literally. And when they reach Lake Tanganyika, finally, their goal, Burton can barely walk. He's been near death for so long that he can barely walk. He has to be carried up the hill to look at the lake he's discovered. And Speak is literally blind. And so Burton sort of lurching around, and Speak says, what lake, you know? Huh? And, I mean, they, they, these are two very, very decrepit white men. Because this is Africa before antibiotics, and, and barely in the quinine era. So they're, they have a lot of maladies all of the time. You'll see one in this comic parody by, <laughs> by uh, uh, Jim Carrey here in a second. But at one point, Speak is in this tent, and the bugs are just crawling over them by the thousands. I mean, just imagine this, just you know, ants that are six inches long. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's rough. And so Speak gets this earwig or this beetle that crawls into his ear. I mean, literally, he's lying and sleeping, and this beetle crawls into his ear. And then he wakes up. It's floating, you know, clawing around in there. And it's driving him crazy, as of course it would anyone. And so he tries a bunch of remedies, and eventually he makes the terrible mistake of putting a knife in his ear, <laughs> which kills the beetle, but also bursts his eardrum. And then it's, his eardrum infects and separates for months, and his whole face swells up and you know, 
cups and pints of pus come out of his head. And, and this is like, this is just a, like a Tuesday in Africa. <laughs> you read this and you can hardly even sleep at night. You know, I, I fumigated my room after reading this book. <laughs> this is just like one incident of this thing. Yeah. I, I've got a quotation here. This is Burton describing Speaks killing of hippopotami. Right, that's good. And, and, uh, and it really tells you something. He, uh, in fact, Burton is talking about, the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, I'm not to the quote yet, but the lust for slaughter is excessive even by Victorian sporting standards, and the killing is gratuitous, for Burton makes it clear that the carcasses could not be retrieved for meat. And this is really upset Burton because he's just wantonly killing these animals. He's, and Burton's very humane towards other people and wildlife and yeah. so on. Um, so on one day, Speak killed six hippo, uh, hippos and mortally wounded a dozen others. Now this is Burton's description of what's going on. Whenever a head appears an inch above water, a heavy bullet puds into it or near it. Crimson patches marble the stream. Some die and disappear. Others plunge in crippled state, while others disabled from diving by holes drilled through their snouts splash and scurry about with curious snorts caused by the breath passing through wounds. A baby hippo, with the naivete natural to his age, uprears his crest, doubtless despite the maternal warning, off flies the crown of the little kid's head. The bereaved mother rises for an instant, viciously regards the infocide, who is, who is quietly loading, snorts a parent's curse, and dies as the cap is being adjusted. So Burton is upset. He's grossed out by this. Grossed out it's by mayhem. This mayhem, and it's and it's wanton slaughter and killing. And Burton never does that. He he only hunts to eat, and only in extremity. And he always treats the natives with respect. And and speak as cuffing them and cursing them and doing horrible things to them all the time. Uh, speak is like a British prig, and Burton is this sort of infiltrator. And so that's one of the reasons that they start to quarrel. And Speak, too, thinks that Burton has gone native, and he resents it. I mean, they get to these villages where they're Arabs, and Burton will, they'll spend a week recuperating, and Burton was in the bazaar every day and talking and having this great time and learning tremendous amounts and writing it all down. Speak is just cut off from the world because he can't talk to anyone but Burton. And Burton's not going to, you know, translate these conversations for him, and Speak's not interested anyway. He doesn't care about these, these primitive people. So, you know, in that, go ahead. First. Well, no, I know that you're going to, uh, this is going to be our l little, last little bit of Africa, I think. Okay. Right, because, you know, when, when Burton gets the spear through his face, at that same debacle on the coast, Speak is captured, and they tie him to the ground, and then they, they literally, these natives drive spears through his thighs into the ground. And he lives. He, he escapes and lives. But one of the things that interests me about this whole era of colonialism is, is colonialism in popular culture, Larry. And I remember, I'll bet some of you do too, as a child, seeing cartoons on the television of David Livingston and Stanley. And they would have these extremely um, race stereotype natives with giant ears and so on. And, and, they, and these cartoons were ubiquitous and they were... They were a big part of popular culture during this period, Looney Tunes. And the story of Stanley and Livingston is one of the most often repeated stories in the history of exploration. And Jim Carrey, this is the stupid movie by Jim Carrey, Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls. Some of you will have seen it. All of you will tomorrow. But <laughs> they recreate the speak incident with the spears in it in a, in a quite funny way. So I thought we could just look at that for a little comic relief here for a minute. Oxford train. Oh, yonke mawashutu napanda kwa lomunye. She says you have passed all tests but one. Only left is Wachutu circle of death. Funny. That's my specialty. This is it. I have to.
to beat him. Alrighty then. I must tell you. I do not wish to fight you. Violence is no longer in my nature. But if you want it, you got it, sister. <laughs> my name I see. I was unaware that the Wachinkus were fighters. Well, why don't you try this on and see how it fits? <laughs> Ace! He's much better fighter than you. Do it! Yeah! Equip to water! All right! This white devil thing has gone far enough. Nobody! Messes with the dude! He quen su ocha! He famaje! He said, sorry, white devil, but he must kill you now. Yeah. I'll have you know I have the reflexes of a cat and the speed of a mongoose. Throw it. I dare ya. Well, Larry, it comes to that. It but, comes to <laughs> but that is a, you see what they're, they're playing off on this incident with Speak on Would the Speak coast. Would Speak appreciate we're, we're, this characterization? Of I, don't, I don't think so, no. Uh, uh, okay. But it's very racist in its own way, but it's funny because it's, it, there's a long tradition of popular culture coming out of that age of exploration of people like Speak Burton and Livingston and Stanley, and it continues to percolate. It continues to have cultural resonance long after most of us have forgotten those incidents. Mm -hmm. I was amazed at the, and you've already alluded to this, but the hardships these guys went through. I mean, you know, these guys are carried by litters. I mean, they're out exploring, but they can't even move. And so people are, porters are carrying them on litters. And when Speak, uh, I know there's a comment about when Speak uh, is climbing this wall and the shotgun goes off, one of his arms is paralyzed. He can't, doesn't even have use to one of his arms because of all these infirmary, in, infirmities that he's uh, suffered. Well, Livingston, too. You know, Livingston, early in his career in Africa, was mauled by a lion. And the lion grabbed him by the arm and shook him like a rag doll and nearly killed him. And, and somehow Livingston managed to get out of it, and his arm was never useful after that. So he then spends 25 or more years still exploring Africa after that incident. And, you know, Burton had this spear through the face. I mean, just try to imagine that for a minute. Spear through the face in 1853 or 4. He then is at it for the rest of his life. He explores all over the world for the rest of his life. A lot of, a lot of us would retire after that incident. <laughs> but he patched himself back up and got right back out there. Okay, let's. Um, Maybe we I, should do. We're going to run running short here. Take a question or a lot of. Well, I want to cover one area here um, quickly. 
And then we'll see if there's any questions here in the audience, but let's talk a little bit uh, more about the marriage. And uh, Isabel adores uh, Burton, I think, uh, and he has this aversion to her almost. And so it's, it's a strange marriage at best, but um, let's talk about the pay, pack, and follow. <laughs> the, okay, you had that. Yeah, beginning of the PowerPoint, yeah. Uh, yeah. the phrase that I used was pay, pack, and follow. Now here's, I mean, here's the deal. She saw Burton as a young woman and she fell head over heels in love with him. And she never changed her tune. And she went to a gypsy, this was in Boulogne in France, and she saw him and he was already the kind of charismatic Burton. And yet his adventures were mostly still ahead of him. And she saw him and she went to a gypsy this is actually before she met Burton. She went to a gypsy, and the gypsy said, you will marry this traveler who is part of our tribe. And she took that as prophecy. She's a very odd Catholic in this sense. But she takes that as prophecy, and then she meets Burton, and then she waits six years, I think, between meetings, and holds this torch for a man she has only had one tiny brief encounter with in a public place and she worships him, and she's fascinated, and she follows his career through the times, and eventually they're married in 1861. And he actually talks her into the marriage. Um, he says, now or never. You know, either we do this or I'm gonna move on, you'll never see me again. And so she risks enormous um, social uh, backlash by marrying Burton. But she does it. And her, her mother says, if you marry Burton, I will never talk to you again. It's sort of a classic, over-the-top Victorian story. And her mother never does forgive her for marrying Burton. Anyway, so she marries him. And, but she knew going in what she was getting. This isn't one of those situations where you marry a guy and he turns out to be Burton. She knew she was marrying Burton. And she understood that her life was going to be being with this extraordinarily hard to pin down person. So what would happen, I mean literally, I'm not exaggerating as you know, they would be asleep together in their bed in London and nothing would have been said and she would wake up in the morning and there'd be a note on her pillow saying, I left for Africa, I'll be back in three years. No talk about it. Just one morning he's not there and there's a note and then at the end of the note he'd say pay, pack, and follow. And all of her life she'd got these pay, pack, and follow notes where she'd have to pay off all the bills, she'd have to pack his 10,000 books, and then she'd have to follow him to South America or follow him to Fernando Po or follow him to Damascus or follow him to Trieste. He's constantly disappearing in the middle of the night and leaving these pay, pack, and follow notes. And Elizabeth, I'm sure she was a little annoyed, <laughs> but she accepted this, that this is the price of being Burton's wife, and then she would pay, pack, and follow, and a few months later, she'd catch up with him somewhere. They'd live together for three months, 18 months, five years, and then suddenly, gone in the night. <laughs> Damascus. He wanted Damascus. You see, he, Burton was a very, very, very serious Orientalist. An Orientalist is somebody who's a special, an academic specialist in Near Eastern and Eastern cultures. He knows these 29 languages. He knows Islam inside and out. He knows Coptic Christians and he knows Marianites. And he, I mean, probably there have been few people in the history of the world that have understood comparative culture as much as, as Richard Francis Burton. And so the plum post for him is Damascus in Syria at the heart of the Middle East. And he's wanted this all of his life, and he really deserves it. And Isabel goes to the foreign office and works on his behalf every time, and she finally secures for him Damascus. They go there in 1869. And he gets crosswise with a local Muslim pasha, which was going to happen no matter what. There are pogroms going on here where Christians are murdered, 3,000 of them overnight, Jews are killed, uh, subsects of, of Muslims are killed. This is, Damascus is, is one of the most violent places on earth in 1869, and Burton has to go in and try to maintain some colonial order there. So 
almost nobody could succeed. And somebody as deeply active as Burton is probably doomed to failure. But Isabel is really who cost him Damascus, because she got going with a Catholic group there and tried to protect them against persecution. And anyway, she, because of her piety and her sort of uh, Catholic super allegiance, she compromised his diplomatic mission. And he was recalled. And when he was recalled in 1871, it broke his heart, because this was like the summum bonum. This was the thing that he had been tending towards all of his life, and it was respectability. He was now a, a serious part of the British diplomatic establishment and one of its key outposts in the world. And he was the man that knew more about this than anyone else on Earth. And to be recalled in shame was just terrorizing to his spirit and had to cause some domestic um, unrest, I would think. So then she goes back to Britain, and she fights hard and gets him Trieste. And they send him to Trieste, which is, as I said, on the it was an uh, Austro-Hungarian outpost on the what's now the Yugoslav-Italian border. And they spend the last 18 years of their life there. It's really a sinecure. They've really kicked him upstairs and given him a harmless post in a, in a part of the world that's not very important to the British Empire. And then he, it's there that he writes a bunch of books. He does the Kama Sutra, does 1001 Arabian Nights, does, publishes and republishes all of his previous books. And so he becomes a scholar. One of the things I really like about this period, Larry, is that, and I've tried to do this in my own little life, but he has a, Burton had a different desk for every project. So in his, he'd always get these gigantic villas where he would live. And then he would have a desk for his guerrilla project. He was one of the first people to write about guerrillas. He'd have a desk for his Damascus project. But each of his projects had a different dedicated desk where he could leave his books. And he would just get up at dawn and move from desk to desk and write 100 pages a day. And then at 4 o'clock, they'd go down into the city and dine with their friends and drink a little too much and then start again the next day. And so during that period, even though he was basically in diplomatic exile, it turned out to be one of the very most productive periods of his entire life intellectually. His adventures now are adventures in language rather than adventures in geography. I appreciated the comment the Foreign Service thought by sending them to Italy, Isabel's Catholicism could not get him in trouble. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty safe bet. Well, she was something. You know, she was really an over-the-top human being, which he was too. But the world could absorb him a little better than it could absorb her. Um, now, a man that would never be called a Christian, I would think, uh, safely, uh, is baptized and given last rites and this huge Catholic funeral. You know, every, every marriage, as you all know if you're in one, is a series of interesting negotiations where you know if you if you do pay pack and follow for 30 years she's going to get something in return <laughs> you know she's going to she's going to extract some concessions because of that and the concession that Isabel extracted was that he would allow her notice the phrasing here he would allow her to pretend that he was a Catholic. He wasn't a Catholic, and she knew it. He was probably Islamic if he had an actual spiritual life. But he let her create the illusion that he really was about to convert at any time. And so when he died, she just had at it. Um, and, and just destroyed all the salacious stuff in his files and wrote this biography which constantly saying he's just, he was just about to become a Catholic, but then something happened. But she, she tried to shape his biography to make it a more standard Catholic British biography than in fact it was. But that was, that was her insistence, and she pulled it off. Fascinating man, fascinating couple. And we've got time a few for minutes, some questions. Yeah. A few minutes here for questions from the audience, if anybody has any. Yes, in the back. Ah, oh, yes. Thank you for asking that question. Yes, I, I want to say, Larry, and I'm very proud that I'm the founding 
president of the North Dakota chapter of the International Sir Richard Francis uh, Burton Geographic Society. Are you the only member right now? Or? Larry, I think I resent that. Uh, <laughs> there are a handful of members in okay. good standing, okay. and we meet periodically. And when we meet, we, we have a potluck, and we eat, somebody gives a little talk, and then we lavish our attention on maps, and it, it's a small group, <laughs> but it's a very dedicated group. Sounds and good. if anyone is interested, we have a blackballing system, and I can assure you, you're out. <laughs> but we have an induction system, and you, know, you don't have to take a spear or anything, it's just, it's a quiet little club of people who, who love geography, and if anyone is interested, just see me or, or write me, and we, we meet from time to time. And we would, you know, Larry, if you would get rid of the glasses, we would even consider you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Mike has one. Let's take Mike's. Uh, well, that's, uh, I should say Mike is a, is a founding member of the Burton Society, too, here in North Dakota. But um, the question is, I mean, there, it, has, it, it has crossed my mind, Larry, that as a, as a person who has spent a fair amount of his life disguised as dead people, <laughs> uh, that I may, there may be a reason that I'm kind of drawn to Burton. But... I don't, I mean, I do see, I do think that, that disguise is a very liberating thing. I think that we all have a, we all adopt a persona. I mean, not to get too deep into the psychology of this, but each one of you in this room has, has crafted a, a persona, a kind of a narrative and a style and an approach and a voice and gesture system. It could be different. I mean, each one of us could be something different. And, and if you have siblings, you see that that often happens. But... We, we wind up in life crafting a persona. And so there are, you know, authenticity is a very difficult question philosophically and psychologically because we, we construct our personalities, we don't just have them. And so I think that for me, doing Chautauqua characters, Jefferson or Theodore Roosevelt or J. Robert Oppenheimer, liberates me to play with personalities that I'm not. I, I have a very, I'm 54 years old, I have a personality, it changes, but it's basically set. But when I take on Jefferson, I have to be an 18th century man, and if I take on Oppenheimer, I have to be a 20th century scientist, and there's a liberation that comes in that. There's, the disguise is pleasurable for that reason. Now, my disguise is a pretty thin one. I mean, no one really ever believes that I'm any of those things. The difference is that Burton could really pull it off. I mean, he was a genius of staggering proportions. I'm just a little dabbler at the, at the kind of stupid ass edge of this thing. <laughs> this, this was a guy who could pass in an alien culture um, when it was life and death to be able to do it. And so the, the, the psychological stakes are higher with somebody like Richard Francis Burton, but it suggests to me um, a, a, an unsettled core personality. I think that people who do this sort of work, it has to be said, must have some sort of unsettled core self-identity because they're shopping. And so there's that. I think that he was, unlike me, I think that, and, and any comparisons are just kind of silly in this way, but, but Burton was radically unhappy with his culture. I mean, he, he regarded England in 1850 as the most claustrophobic place on earth. And so for him, it was liberation of a different sort. He was getting out from what he regarded as the most suppressive and repressive and depressing culture in the world, and every other one looked better to him, including the Mormon church. And so I think that was his strategy of disguise in, in large part. You could go on and on in this way, but I'm attracted to him because of this. I mean, if, if, the, if you take the disguise element out of Burton, and if he's just an anthropologist, 
I find him much less interesting. And I think what makes him so successful is his, capacity, his empathic capacity to, to int, in, intrudes the wrong word, his capacity to enter other cultures and absorb, not just hear, but absorb cultural styles and norms that were not his own. And there's a real genius in that. And it makes, it makes him an incredibly fascinating man. I don't think I've done justice to this question. Yeah. Using the term absorb, one of his biographers said that he absorbed languages through his skin, which is how he ended up with 29 languages. He had a couple of methods for absorbing language, uh, one which I highly recommend, another one which is a little more dicey. But uh, his basic method was to, was to take a book that he knew really well. He happened to know the Bible really well, and he would then get a dictionary and a grammar and then use a, a text that he knew intimately Back then, people knew their Bible by heart, basically. And then he would use that as his window into the other culture. So his, he had a, a fast-forwarding method of doing this. His other method, I think you read probably in this book, was that when he would go to a new culture, he would go into these shabby slum areas of town, and he would hire a prostitute, not for sex, but to live with him for a month because he believed that then she would tell him what a computer is and what a lamp is and what a pencil is and what a dog is, that she, he would hire her for her unpretentious, unacademic, literary capacities. And then he would basically live with her for the amount of time it took him to absorb what's this, what's this, what's this. And who knows whether there was sexual activity. That's sort of neither here nor there. But his way of doing it was to find a local woman who would give her linguistic capacities to him for a, a prolonged period of time. 29 languages. Must work. There's a, yes, sir. Yeah, my question, I mean, it is a question, kind of a statement. Uh, isn't it a shame that the world's so well known and so small now that we can never have another Livingston Stanley, Lewis and Clark, uh, Berkeley? I mean, there's nothing more to explore. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, uh, we have space, we have the sea, we ha there are some you know, remote places, there are certainly cultures that are inadequately understood, but basically the big riddles have been solved. And Meriwether Lewis, who is one of my heroes and also a kind of a cracked human being, um, discovered the source of the Missouri in August of, of 1805, and John Wesley Powell, another one of my characters, explored the last uncharted part of the American West, the Colorado River Basin and Plateau in 1869 and 71. And, you know, basically we've run out of new places on Earth to explore from a geographic, from a kind of a, a basic geographic point of view. The, the sources of these rivers are known. And I have deep, deep personal identification with these explorers. Something about it, I was, I was just thinking about source hunting today. I mean, the, what is it about source hunting? Why do they so, what's the mania with that? You know, take, just take for a quick example, Larry, um, the Mississippi River. Um, Jefferson sent out Zebulon Pike in 1805, and Pike found the source of the Mississippi, which he thought was Malak. Well, it wasn't. And Schoolcraft came in the 1830s, and Schoolcraft settled the issue of the Mississippi at Itasca. And the word Itasca, I mean, a lot of people know this, but the word Itasca is a Latin clip, which comes from the phrase veritas caput. Veritas caput means the true head or the true source. And so when he, when he found the source of the Mississippi, he wrote veritas caput. It got clipped on both ends until Itasca <laughs> remains. We think it's an Indian word. <laughs> it's Latin. But he thought he found the head of the Mississippi River. Well, there is no head of the Mississippi. There are thousands of heads of the Mississippi. This one is the one we've chosen. And so there's a, it's very interesting. I find it utterly fascinating that, our, that 19th century and early 20th century culture, European culture, insisted upon these sorts of demarcations. Where's the mouth? Where's the source? What's the main stem? What's the tributary? And the work that I've done on Lewis and Clark has been just incredibly informative in this. The, the peoples of the, of the Columbia Basin, for example, don't ever name a full river. They don't name the Columbia or the Snake. That's not the way their minds work. 
their mind was that's the place where the kid was drowned last year, or that's the place where the antelope cross at the time of the trees losing their leaves. Native cultures tend to, to name a place and an event, but only a localized one and never, what's this whole river? What's this whole watershed? That's our way of thinking. And this source obsession was a very big part of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. And the, the mother load was the Nile. And whoever got the Nile was going to be Neil Armstrong squared and cubed. He, you know, this was going to be the greatest geographer on Earth. And that's why they were all just so incredibly obsessed with this thing. We do have another question in the back. Go ahead. Well, if that's true, you know, I think we should call President Obama because <laughs> let's with invest this, in spam. Well, with this economic debacle, we could go to a spam currency. There we go. That's right. no, no, I, I take your point, Margie. That I think that's true. That these things are used as currency. And just, I just want to answer or respond to her point for just a second. It's true about space, and it's true about the sea. But here's the difference: you can't walk off the edge of the map. You're in a vessel. It's controlled by engineers. You're surrounded by hermetically sealed functions. Some exploration can be done with scuba diving gear. Even that creates mediation between you and the thing you're seeing. But the kind of exploration that Burton represents, or Lewis, where you just literally walk off the known end of the world into the unknown and see what it brings you without a lot of support team, that kind of romantic lone wolf Thing. It's, not, it's not that I'm privileging it over what she's saying, because I think that systematic science is really important. But there's something, for me, deeply, deeply compelling with that lone wolf somewhere in the wilderness facing whatever comes paradigm. And that's gone, I think, mostly. Yes? Well, that's a great question. I mean, does our culture preclude this sort of extrusion of this unique sort of individual? I, I'm going to take a, uh, I mean, I don't know anything about this, really, because it's so hard to generalize on, on questions of this sort. But Burton, I dare say, was as unusual in 1850 as he would be in 2009 or 10. I think that Burton belongs, I mean, he is clearly a cracked human being. There are, there's deep dysfunction at the center of his marriage, um, his, his sexual curiosity about clitoridectomy and infibriation and sexual customs and practices around the world is not without a certain prurience that is disquieting to us. Uh, his marginality as a historical figure, his deliberate flouting of convention and getting himself in trouble over and over. I mean, there's clearly something unresolved and unclear at the center of Burton's soul, but uh, that may be true of genius, generally speaking. I don't know. But I think that it's fair to say that one in not just a million, but one in tens of millions of people on Earth is somehow extruded into this sort of extraordinary capacity. And that it doesn't happen very often. And when it happens, it probably is dysfunctional in some normal sense of psychology or social structure. 
the world can't absorb much of this. It, could, it couldn't really absorb Burton. He got away with it because he walked, that's what this, this sentence says from the book, that you know, he walked on the edges of the earth. By walking on the edges of the earth, he was sufficiently out of Trafalgar Square to be able to pull it off to a certain degree. By taking on reckless projects, he sort of got licensed to be as eccentric as he in fact was. So I'm, I'm glad that the Victorian age could somehow absorb this guy and publish him. And I think that when this sort of person comes along, it's a sign of a healthy culture that it finds some way to employ him. I don't mean in economic terms, but employ his or her remarkable talents. But you know, this is not Jefferson. This is not Lewis. This is not Powell. This is not Oppenheimer. This is not Stanley. This is something way off the edge of the charts. And so I think that, that, that you really have to see him as, as essentially a unique human being. And I don't think you have to see Meriwether Lewis as a unique human being. I think you see Lewis as an unusual human being, but not a unique one, if that makes any sense. And well, we've run over time a little bit. I think that's a great Because of that Mexico thing. There's a Mexico thing. I'm, I apologize for that. I'm sorry about that. I'll be the focus now. Okay, yeah. So thank you very much, Clay. Thank you, thank everyone, you everyone, for joining us.